On the phone, it is Ari Berman, live from Washington, D.C. Ari, are you, are you exhausted? Uh, oh, exhausted doesn't even begin to uh, capture how I feel. But I, I am, it's a relieved exhaustion, at least, not a despairing exhaustion. Indeed, yeah, this would be a, uh, a rough day uh, if, for some reason, for, what is it, um, 70 electoral votes went the other direction. This was a pretty massive win, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a really massive win. And, and Sam, the, the prophet that you are, you confidently uh, predicted it uh, from day one. Uh, I, I, was, I was a little less sure. And having reported on voter suppression for about a, a year and a half, um, I thought there was definitely the potential uh, for one or more recounts here. And I thought there was a good chance uh, that it would come down to to the provisional ballots in places like Ohio and Florida, and that we wouldn't know the election results uh, for quite a long time. Uh, I'm glad that didn't happen. It would have been a good story for me to cover, um, but I'm glad it didn't happen. And uh, hopefully uh, tomorrow we can go back to normal and we can start talking about um, actually governing this country instead of campaigning for two years. Now, let me tell you uh, right now, because I want to talk, uh, you know, I want to talk about just your thoughts on the general election, but I want to focus because you've been... Uh, uh, covering this voter suppression beat um, as well as anybody in the country. And I think, frankly, also, um, your reporting, uh, that piece you did in the Rolling Stone, I think really um, mobilized people because uh, this could have, many of these voter suppression tactics could have easily gone the other way. Uh, but there was a, a full court press by, um, uh, you know, many, many groups out there that uh, got a lot of these decisions reversed in time. Uh, but right now, I am looking at a photo taken of uh, Fox News, uh, where the uh, host is talking to a reporter. I don't know where that reporter is. And the, um, the lower third has voter fraud at foxnews.com. They're obviously looking for reports of voter fraud. Uh, and they have set up an entire email uh, just to get all of those that are rushing in. Um, give us just... Uh, a a broad overview of why you thought that, I mean, because uh, give us just a sort of like, I guess, a broad overview of the timeline of what happened. You know, it's hard to generalize it, but I know that we had uh, 10 to 12 states that following the takeover by Republicans in 2010 of these state legislatures, which also, we should add, contributed to uh, the Republicans retaining the House because they also redistricted. Yeah. Uh, and that's one measure of how they tried to suppress and disenfranchise, particularly minority voters. You wrote quite a bit on that as well. Uh, but then there was this, uh, basically this pushback, mostly through the legal system, partly through uh, the Department of Justice. Yeah, so w w there was really two big changes that resulted from Republicans controlling uh, state legislatures after the 2010 election. One was that they were able to draw their own legislative districts, and they were able to basically secure a lot of their legislative members. And the only reason that Republicans held the House last night was because they, they gerrymandered so many seats to put themselves in safe districts and to win. So they succeeded on that front, and they could control these seats for the next decade until the next census comes out. But the other thing they did was in more than a dozen states, they changed the election laws uh, in one now, way hold or on another for one to second. restrict Let the me, right to vote. Hold on for and one second. That, hold on for one second, because I want to just make sure that we, we, we are clear on this. I know we've talked about it on this program before, but not only did they secure the, their seats in terms of gerrymandering uh, their districts, which, which has happened, you know, decent, you know it certainly happens in the past, but never maybe with this sort of, uh, this robust of an effort. But what they, they also did was they, they did it by essentially corralling minority voters into specific districts. Uh, right? I mean, it wasn't just... Yeah, what they did, what they did particularly in the South was they took um, integrated districts and they turned them into uh, overwhelmingly black districts or overwhelmingly white districts as a way to basically uh, corral as many Democratic minority voters as possible into as few of districts as possible. And so that's how they were able to hold or gain seats in states like North Carolina. And, and I thought that was so 
distressing because it's not just a political issue, it's a civil rights issue. I mean, you are taking uh, integrated districts that are in many ways a signal of the progress that we've made in America, and you're taking us back to a day when there were no integrated districts in the South. And that's not only what happened through redistricting, that's what happened through voting as well. I mean, it was very clear what the GOP was trying to do when they changed the voting laws, either through making it harder to register to vote, cutting back on early voting, requiring voter ID laws, was to make it harder uh, for this growing coalition of voters in America, young people, blacks, Hispanics, to be able to cast a ballot. Now, I think that strategy backfired on them, and I think it backfired for two reasons. Number one, a lot of these laws were overturned, and they were overturned because there was a massive pushback through the courts to block these laws. And there was a lot of great work done by civil rights groups to get the evidence before judges to say these laws are discriminatory. The second thing is that they motivated particularly newly, particularly immigrant communities and um, historically disenfranchised communities, particularly the black vote, to turn out. I was in Cleveland uh, the weekend before the election. I was spending a lot of time in black churches, and you heard over and over and over, they're trying to take away our vote. And people may have been disappointed with Barack Obama, but when you try to take away their voting rights, they're going to vote. And I think you saw the huge turnout among black voters for Obama, and I think the GOP's suppression strategy motivated more people to get out there and to exercise that constitutional right and to protect it going forward. And 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 like you say, the uh, you know there was and, and I've got the breakdown. We the the Democrats picked up a couple of uh, state uh, legislators last uh, legislatures last night. Um, and the, some of these voting rights may be, I mean, voting rights may be restored uh, statutorily, I guess. Uh, that, that remains to be seen. I don't know that, uh, you know, down in the South, those things are going to come back. And certainly, like you say, the redistricting only happens every 10 years. Um, so uh, the uh, all in all, I think, you know, to a certain extent, um, many of these things were pushed back. And I think it also, you know, it, it, I think you're right about it creating this greater appreciation for the right to vote. Uh, I mean, think about how much time we spent talking about the right to vote in the past two years. I, I, I mean, people had to go through a, an incredible number of hurdles to be able to vote in certain cases, but the fact that we had that conversation, I think, made uh, a lot of people uh, think more about voting, think more about how we vote. And I do think that Republicans are, are really face a tough choice right now. They can either continue with the suppression strategy and risk alienating the fastest growing segments of the electorate, or they can try to court an increasingly diverse electorate by changing their policy positions <laughs> on things like immigration reform. If they don't change their policy positions, and I think it's going to be very difficult for them to do so given the Tea Party base of the party, which determines who wins primaries and who is nominated. I think they're going to have to continue with the suppression strategy, but I don't think it's going to be a popular one because everyone saw those lines in Florida, and that pissed people off. They're like, why is this happening again in 2012? They knew it was deliberate. They knew that Republicans shortened the early voting periods. This was the result. And so anytime you're going to make voting inconvenient, it's going to be unpopular. The other big thing was in Minnesota, a voter ID ballot initiative was defeated. It's the first time a voter ID ballot initiative has been defeated. Granted, it's Minnesota, but still, Minnesota was something of a swing state. It's, it's not the bluest state in the country. And so that tells me that, at least among Democrats and some independents, they're realizing what voter ID is. They're realizing it's not about stopping voter fraud. In-person voter fraud doesn't exist. It's about shaping an electorate to Republicans' favor. And the fact that that went down is going to make it harder for Republicans to pass these laws in, in other uh, purple states going forward. So, uh, okay, uh, first off, I, I think you're absolutely right about that voter suppression. In fact, I opened the show today uh, with, uh, the, with basically talking about that dynamic. You hear the Peggy Noonans, even Dick Morris, uh, Britt Hume, saying, uh, basically you're saying that the Republican Party has to change its hostility to certain uh, voting groups. Uh, uh, otherwise, you just can't compete on a national level. And uh, I, I agree with your assessment. There's no way they can do it. They are no. trapped in essentially what, you know, is the equivalent of an insurance pool death spiral. They just, <laughs> they, it is, I mean, they, they, can't, they can't do it. They have simply, uh, they, they have banked on, uh, on certain things. They have built an infrastructure. 
uh, cottage industries around the these mentalities, and there is too much misaligned incentives for them to be able to make this uh, turn. And I think it's going to continue to isolate them, and I think they're going to continue to do these uh, voter suppression because it's going to be the only option for them. And I think it's going to continue to blow back. But here's and can I say one other thing about this? Go ahead. I think Democrats need to get serious about expanding the right to vote. Now that they're in positions of power, That's... they need to do something about this. California passed online and same-day voter registration. That's huge. We need to do that everywhere. There's no reason that if you are a Democrat, and I would hope Republicans would adopt this too, although I'm not holding my breath, if you're a state legislature in one of these places in the majority, if you're a governor, if you're a member of the Senate, you should be right away, first day of the session, promoting a bill for same-day registration in your state. You should be promoting online registration. You should be promoting early voting. The only way long-term to counter the suppression strategy is to have a strategy that expands the right to vote. And we have 50 million people in this country who aren't registered to vote. We had untold numbers of people in this country who showed up and told they weren't registered to vote and had to cast provisional ballots or couldn't wait in line for seven hours or didn't have the right ID to be able to vote in places like Kansas and Tennessee where voter ID laws are now on the books and weren't blocked in court. And so I'd like to to see politicians of both parties uh, get a lot more serious about about election reform now. And and people have to understand this has to happen on the state level because there is yeah. no federal mechanism uh, in which to there is no I mean this is the thing that I think people don't really fully grasp uh, because it, it in some ways it's completely astonishing but even for federal elections like the president like uh, Congress like the Senate there is no federal statutory regime statutory regime to uh, to 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 normalize the the voting procedures across the country. No, I mean there's different laws that have been passed, like the Help America Vote Act, that have standardized some portions of American election law. But there's no doubt that election law varies state by state by state. Um, we have partisan election officials in charge of running our elections, which is an inherent conflict of interest. We have a situation now where the GOP is challenging Section Five of the Voting Rights Act, which applies to uh, parts or all of 16 states, saying they need to get approval from the federal government. Instead of challenging Section Five of the Voting Rights Act and overturning it. I would like to see every state subject to Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act um, so that if states try to enact discriminatory voting laws, uh, the federal government has some mechanism to stop it, which they don't have right now in uh, 34 different states. But Section 5 is crucially important. This is the next battle in voting rights. We don't know when the Supreme Court's going to take this case, but likely it'll be heard um, next spring. Uh, And I think all the evidence that we saw this year of Republicans trying to suppress the vote should be used in court to show why we still need the protections of the Voting Rights Act. So, all right. So, um, you know, that's the that's my biggest hope is is that, you know, it, it just seems like voter suppression only comes up, obviously, you know, in the months before uh, the election, because then we it's in front of our face, and then everybody forgets about it, and then it comes up again, and it's been happening since, well, at least you know, in 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 my consciousness, since two thousand, right? I mean, we've had six elections uh, since then, and it, it seems to happen almost every time. This year was a little bit more dramatic, I think, because of um, the, the Republicans were more aggressive about it because, like you say, it's their last vestige. So hopefully this can, this, this can be an issue. You know, they say the best time to get a lawyer is when you don't need one. The best time <laughs> to do uh, these type of uh, expanding the, the right to vote and the access to a ballot, essentially, is when you're as far away as, from an election as possible. Well, and I think this time the laws passed were worse, but the pushback was greater. 2000 really caught everyone by surprise. Uh, 2004 was just so chaotic. There was so much stuff going on that no one really knew what was going to happen on Election Day. And, and quite frankly, no one was really prepared for what happened in Ohio in 2004 with this, those just incredibly long lines. Uh, 2008 went relatively smoothly, and I think because it went smoothly, Republicans decided that they needed to do something additional uh, to ensure that they would win. And then, and then so what we saw in 2012 was a 
lot of chaos, a lot of confusion. But I think the fact that people were so alert to what was going to happen uh, mitigated some of these problems. There's no doubt that some people were disenfranchised. We don't know yet uh, how many people were turned away because they didn't have the right ID or how many people couldn't wait online for seven hours or how many people were forced to cast provisional ballots that were not ultimately counted. I mean, we're going to know this kind of stuff in the coming weeks as we get the reports from different states. Um, but there's no doubt that, you know, I was in the thick yesterday in the war room of the Election Protection Coalition, which runs the 866R vote hotline, and the reports coming in there uh, were incredibly alarming. But the good news was that there was a lot of people on the ground to deal with this. There was a lot of people talking about it um, and giving information to voters. And so I, I do think that we have we have to have the most dysfunctional election system of any advanced democracy. I mean, I just can't imagine any country doing it worse than we do it right now. Um, but we have a, I, I we have a lot of Canadian. More, we have a lot of Canadian. Sam, we have a lot of Canadian listeners on this of this program, <laughs> and I can't tell you how many emails we got, like or or tweets I got from people going like, "What the frick is going on down there?" Yeah, I've never heard of such a thing. I mean, you you people are waiting in line for hours to vote. It's just absurd. It is absurd. It, it's just, we it's we have in many ways, you know, a 19th century electoral system in the 21st century in this country. I can't um, wait for Fox it, to come out and say, actually, long lines are good because it prevents um, people who are uh, posing as other people from voting because then they, they can't do it in such widespread ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but you, you, you essentially had a situation where Republicans in Florida said, I want voting to be hard. I don't want it to be easy. And the reason they said that is because, you know, Affluent people don't live in neighborhoods where they have to wait for seven hours. They have fully staffed voting places with short lines and lots of workers and functioning voting machines. People who are less affluent have less staff at their polling place. They have less resources. They have worse voting machines. They have to wait in longer lines. And so these lines target uh, people who are working people who don't have the time or the ability to wait for seven hours. And so the lines were a form of suppression. And the whole idea that voting should be difficult uh, is a form of suppression. And I, I think that's just an idea uh, that is really, really unpopular. I mean, I, th- I think, I think there, there's probably a lot more support for election reform now uh, than there was a few years ago. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the case as well. All right, so um, uh, I appreciate you giving me the time today, but just a couple of words on uh, the, the the presidential election. Were you surprised? Uh, and what do you think about the fact that the the Democrats picked up two Senate seats? They picked up two Senate seats. I mean, if you include um, uh, Sanders and. Um, Angus uh, Angus Khan, what's his name? King. King Angus King. Angus Khan. <laughs> He's Genghis is Kong, the long lost uh, brother, uh, Angus. Ang- uh, who is who ran as an independent up in uh, in Maine? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, he could be the Joe Learman of the Senate, by the way. He se- he seems like a real handful. I, I think the other story, and I didn't follow this as closely, but I'd like to hear more about it. Is the money that was spent? I mean, the GOP got a, a terrible return on investment. I mean, Sheldon Adelson has to be about the dumbest person on the planet right now. How much money did he blow on Newt Gingrich and then Mitt Romney? Uh, Carl Rove well, but, to, but, but to his credit, he did introduce the country to uh, Bain and to the concept of vulture capitalism. So I basically want to send him a thank you. Well, I, mean, that, I would like to say to send you. That is true. I want to send him a muffin a basket right way. now. Um, the, the other thing is that Karl Rove basically snookered a ton of donors. He kept giving them inaccurate information about swing states. He, they poured a ton of money into races that they didn't win. I'm still very, very concerned about the impact of Citizens United on the electoral process. And again, I think this has to be one of the top priorities um, of Democrats is to try to figure out a way uh, to get rid or to at least mitigate this law. Um, but the GOP did not get a good uh, rate of return. The other thing I would just mention, Sam, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this going forward, is now that Democrats have retained their Senate majority, they need to get serious about filibuster reform, because nothing is going to be done in Washington if we 
have a 60-vote threshold in the Senate. So I think a lot of Democrats were afraid to do anything on filibuster reform after the 2010 election because they thought they were going to lose their majority. Now that they haven't lost the majority and they're probably not going to lose it, barring some catastrophic thing happening um, next election cycle, I think it's time to basically say if we want to get stuff done, if we don't want gridlock in Washington, I don't think anyone does want gridlock in Washington, we have to change the rules of the Senate or else we're going to see the next four years be like the last two. Harry Reid said, if I remember correctly, about six to eight months ago, he said, I, I, I admit... I I was wrong on that. I think he yeah, said he Merkley. said he was wrong, and he needs to do something about it now. I wonder now if he was to do it. He to start preparing that. people for changing the rules and explain why it's so important to do so. Yeah, I think that's that's crucial, and I think your point about the money is well taken. I think there's too there's there's going to be too much stories about how uh, Citizens United money didn't make a difference because it's going to imply that it's not going to make a difference in the future. Look, the first election cycle where you have this type of money, it is the perfect opportunity to squeeze, uh, to essentially milk these teats. Uh, I mean, I, you know, honestly, like, you know, this is, I've seen this uh, in my experience in entrepreneurial businesses uh, where big money comes in, it's stupid money, and you've got the, the charlatans or the first guys through the door, they're, they've got the shiny watches, the nice shoes, and they're able to suck as much money out of these people as possible. And the thing that people have to understand is that the reason why Rove and, and, and the like-minded people um, were, were applying this money poorly was because they were applying it in the most profitable way for, for them. And in other words, like, we're going to buy... Like, I, I sat on my couch with my wife, uh, and I don't know when it was, what we were watching, but we were, we were watching... Uh, we saw ads. We saw national Romney ads. And I'm sitting in New York, and I said to my wife, I said, this is the biggest scam in the world. There is, oh, it was Saturday Night Live. We were watching Saturday Night Live, because we, and, because uh, Louie was on this week. And I turned to her, I go, this is the biggest scam in the world. And she's like, why? And uh, because it's hitting all these other places in the country. But, it, but, like, no, they should be targeting these ads in three states right now. And they should be yeah. spending every dollar that they spend, the yield should be, the, the, the voters that count. And this is a scam because he's getting bigger. He's getting a bigger markup on a national ad buy than he would on, uh, you know, Channel 14 in Columbus or whatever it is. Yeah, well, the, the, the other thing I would say is we don't know the impact of big money in down ballot races. We don't know what impact it had in the House or what impact it had in judicial elections uh, and all the way down the line. And, and those races really matter. So the fact that, for example, the Koch brothers went after judges in North Carolina um, is, is a very big deal. And the other thing I would say is just because Obama was reelected doesn't make the disturbing things that happened this election go away. I mean, this was a very, very, very disturbing election, from the voter suppression to the dark money to employers telling their employees who to, to, to vote for. I mean, a lot of really bad stuff happened, and I hope that doesn't set a precedent and basically make it as the new normal, that we're just going to get used to uh, voter suppression laws and unlimited money uh, and uh, employers bossing their employees around. I mean, I really hope that that is not now standard practice for how we run American elections going forward. Yeah, well, I agree. Um, I am a little concerned that that may be the, ca uh, the, the, the case, though. All right, Ari Berman, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sam, and congrats on, on another almost perfect electoral college prediction. Well, uh, and uh, frankly, also... I'm sure I'll never hear you talk see, about you're it gonna see my percentage. Get that out there now. You're going to see my percentage is also right on the money, too, once uh, those votes in California are counted. All right, my friend. I'll I'm talk pretty to you sure soon. we made a bet about it, but uh, another one. But um, I'll go back and check the tape. Okay, go re go review our email traffic. All right.